We're going to set up so you can uh, uh, yeah. chat a bit more if you want. Let's, we'll start in a few minutes. All right. Give him another. No, give him another minute, and then start. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Howard Gardner, and uh, um, welcome to this evening's Ask With Forum. Now, I'm sure you all want to know what the Ask With Forum is, so I'm going to give you the, the tweet. Um, the Ask With Forum brings leaders in the field to campus to share knowledge and engage with our community, the community of the School of Education. These forums help strengthen the intellectual life of the school through conversation, debate, and the exchange of ideas. They are also a way to open our doors to welcome members of the greater Harvard community and the general public. And the next Ask With Forum will be held next Tuesday, November 14th, same time, 5.30, same place. And the topic for the forum, which will give you a sense of the breadth of this enterprise, is how mayors are leading the way on child development and education. So that's... Uh, your primer on the Ask With Forum. Having fulfilled my official role, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Stephen Wolfram to the Graduate School of Education. Now, it's polite decorum to introduce speakers, but Stephen presents a very difficult problem. He's done so many things and is doing so many more things it would take the better part of the evening to introduce him, and then we wouldn't have time to hear from him or to hear from you. So with that as an apology, let me just mention a half a dozen Stephen Wolframs. Number one, a very young scholar who was educated in the England, the UK, and the USA. Stephen published his first scholarly paper at 15, received his PhD in theoretical physics from Caltech at the age of 20. Number two is a certified genius. At the tender age of 21, Stephen became the youngest recipient of the MacArthur Prize Fellowship, the so-called Genius Award. We're not sure if anybody younger ever got it, but I kind of doubt it. Uh, number three, the teacher scholar. Stephen has taught at several universities and has written on a wide range of topics, including a very important book called A New Kind of Science, very big book. And more recently, um, he has been writing about the history of scientific and mathematical thinking. He's been doing podcasts and wrote a very interesting book where he um, described his own experiences and interactions, either in his own mind or directly, with uh, uh, 11 or so important thinkers historically. It's a very, very interesting uh, read. Um, uh, Wolfram number four is the creator of new languages, codes, programs, um, knowledge-based languages. That's his particular uh, focus. Fifth, he's an entrepreneur. He has started a whole set of enterprises, has a, a network of people working with him um, in many places. And I believe this is all done under, under the umbrella of Wolfram Research. Right? Yep. Years, Sixth yes. and last, uh, and most relevant this evening, uh, Stephen is an educator, um, an educator particularly of young people. He has 
run summer schools. Um, he has supported the National Museum of Mathematics, and he has a large computational thinking initiative, which I'm sure we will talk about a lot this evening. So that's a fair sample of uh, the many hats that, that Stephen has worn over the years. So we are at an ed school, and so tonight um, I want to focus on educational issues. And many of us, including me, are confused about what the best education is for young people going forward. Um, we've heard many terms, math, STEM, computing, coding, uh, computational thinking, and uh, my motive for asking Stephen to come here, and I was very happy that uh, he accepted, was to try to uh, remove some cobwebs from my own mind and perhaps help you think more clearly about these issues. The plan is that we're going to talk here on the podium for 30 or 40 minutes, then open it up to questions from the audience. We have microphones here and the usual patterns for people just to go up to the mic and to ask your questions. And um, I'll ask you, or your comments, but whether you're making a question or a comment, please make it clear and please make it succinct. Okay. So welcome, Stephen. Thanks. Thanks again for accepting our invitation. And when this uh, program was advertised, and I take responsibility for this, I used the word mathematical thinking or mathematical. It's mathematics. And you said, well, that's not really what I think about and what I want to talk about. So um, uh, as I said to you beforehand, I want to sort of start with definitions and epistemology so we can have some sense of what these different terms mean and then move gradually to more specific educational challenges. So, I mean, why, why change from mathematical thinking to computational thinking? Computational thinking is a bigger, more significant thing that is kind of, I think, will be kind of remembered as probably the most important kind of intellectual uh, achievement of the 21st century is kind of the, the beginning of serious computational thinking. You know, mathematical thinking is something which kind of was very important 300 years ago in the kind of the beginning of modern exact science and so on, and it's had lots of effects, but computational thinking is, is kind of a bigger thing. I view mathematical thinking as sort of a, a subset of computational thinking. So I mean, if we, if we say, what is computational thinking, right? One, one definition of it that I might give is, it's the, it's the activity for a human of taking something that they want to know about or that they want to have happen in the world and formulating it in such a way that a sufficiently smart computer can then know what to do. Now, the sufficiently smart part, that's what I've spent my life trying to build, is, the, is to make the computer sufficiently smart that you can go from kind of what you as a human think about doing and have a language in which to talk to the computer and explain what you want to have done, and then have the computer as automatically as possible actually go and do it. Um, the, this is kind of, in, when we talk about mathematical thinking, it more tends to, to be about the particular methods that have been successful in mathematics, things with equations, calculus, and so on. These are examples of kind of formal systems, formal structured systems that have been quite successful in bringing us, you know, a lot of modern physics and engineering and so on. What, uh, you know, I happen as a matter of basic science to have spent a certain amount of time trying to generalize the success of mathematics to the more general kind of computational world. I mean, so the question is, if you're trying to make a model of a thing, for example, something in nature, how do you make that model? And the sort of the big discovery of 300 years ago by people like Newton and so on was you can use math to make models of things like the natural world. And that was a tremendously successful discovery. It's given us lots of kinds of things. The question is, is that the only way we can make models of the natural world, or is there a sort of more general category of model that we can use? And in modern times, when we understand something about programs and computers, we realize, well, we're going to make a model of something. We have to have some definite, structured, formal rules for how the thing works. But the ones that we can embody in a program are more general than the ones that we've considered in mathematics. And so I got interested in this question of, OK, so can we build kind of a way of thinking about the world that makes use of programs and computation rather than the specific constructs of mathematics? And one of, the, one of the things that's happened, actually, in the last 15 years or so since that, that big, big book that you mentioned of mine came out, um, I, 
I, I think it's something to do with the fact that the, my book came out then, but it might just be a, a matter of the progress of the world in general. There's sort of been a transition for, for the last 300 years. When you wanted to make a model of something, the chances are you would use math as the foundation for making that model. You would find an equation for how the thing works or whatever. Now, it is vastly more common to say, we'll make a program that can uh, define the rules for how the system works and we'll then simulate the system or whatever using the program. So in, in 15 years, after 300 years of dominance of kind of the mathematical approach, we've, we've seen this sort of transition to a more computational approach. So um, let's take two figures. Let's take Isaac Newton and let's take Charles Babbage. Babbage. Yes. Um, Newton being a great scientist and also inventor of the calculus along with Leibniz and Babbage being the person who had the idea of a calculating machine, which was an early computer. What would they be surprised about if they were to come back today and what would they say? Well, sure. You should give more credit to Ada Lovelace because she's okay, the one who Ada actually, Lovelace too. I mean, it's Charles Babbage was a, was a good engineer, but Ada actually understood what the point was. Happy to do in, that. In, in a way that, um, that, that Babbage did not. He was, he was deep down trying to calculate okay. mathematical tables. But, but in any case, in, in terms of what's happened today, I think, um, uh, you know, let, let me think. I mean, it, Newton, Newton was at a time, lived at a time when people were very surprised that you could just use math to describe how the world works. And it was like, but there's no mechanism. You know, what's the, what's the mechanism by which the Earth moves according to the you know, law of gravity and so on? And, but in his time, sort of he was fighting the, no, actually, you can just describe it using math. Um, now, we're fighting the opposite battle. It's uh, people saying, but we know math is the way everything works. Actually, I think this battle has been won in the last few years. Um, I think that the, the thing that's always surprising, for, for example, in the case of computation, and particularly the idea of universal computation, which was the idea that, that Ada Lovelace kind of pretty much figured out from what Babbage was doing. I mean, the universal computation is kind of the idea that if you want to run a program that does anything that a program can do, you can use the same computer to run all these different kinds of programs. It might have been the case, and people thought that for a while, that you, know, you want to do addition, you buy an adding machine. You want to do multiplication, you buy a multiplying machine. But actually, there's this idea that you can have a universal computer that can be programmed to do anything. Now, that idea, which sort of came uh, between Gödel and Turing and so on, that idea really emerged as a, as a real thing. But the understanding of, OK, so what can we actually do with these universal machines, that has been slow to come. And we, we only gradually, you know, in my own efforts to sort of understand how one can have the broadest abstract structure for computation, I think I've, at the rate of about once per decade, I understand another major thing that can now be fit into this kind of paradigm of computation. And I mean, you know, when we saw uh, one of the things that's sort of, sort of strange about, well, the, the thing I think that we're seeing today, and that would have surprised, you know, uh, uh, well, I think Newton didn't know anything about things like computers. That was just, that was out of his, his, his world. Um, Leibniz might have liked to know more. Leibniz right? would have been, Leibniz wanted to do, you know, Leibniz was on a path to do a lot of the kinds of things that I've spent my life doing. I mean, Leibniz had the idea, you know, I, there's this thing called Wolfram Alpha, which, which uh, lots of, people use and powers Siri and things like that. That's a computational knowledge engine. And Leibniz had pretty much the idea of building such a thing. But as a cautionary tale to people like me who like to think about what one should do, he was 300 years too early in actually formulating. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was like, um, you know, let's build a, the best calculator we can. I went to see his calculator. It's made of brass and has a bunch of wheels and gears and so on. It took him 30 years to try and get it to be sort of a four-function calculator of its day. And then he was like, let's collect knowledge that we can feed into these things. And he went to convince a bunch of, you know, dukes to build libraries and so on. I had it much easier 300 years later. <laughs> um, the, uh, it's, um, but I think the thing that, that is remarkable today is that we see this kind of paradigm of computation, of thinking about things in computational terms. And it is becoming, we're realizing that it is pretty much applicable to any field that one thinks about. So there's a, you know, my, my way of saying this is, is kind of for any field X, from you know, agriculture to zoology to whatever else, 
there either is now a computational X or there soon will be. And that computational X typically defines the future of that field. It is the, you know, it's the sort of emerging very broad paradigm that, that the things that we're thinking about, it's a way of structuring what we're thinking about, it's a way of making progress with what we're thinking about. Of course, many people, in, including me, are either afraid or skeptical that um, computational ways of thinking will take over every field. Um, let's pick a field. We can okay, talk well, about. Are you, since you said A, let's, let's talk about um, you know, art, let's, let's call it aesthetics, including art history and art appreciation and the making of, of artworks. Right. Now, I think we all agree that you could do lots of computational things. The challenge comes, are you doing the things which uh, are illuminating or simply things which uh, you can do? Uh, yeah, well, okay. that's always, I mean, you know, yeah. that is the story of progress of, of knowledge mm -hmm. is people invent methodologies and then they, you know, fields end up getting defined by their methodologies. We happen to have a broad new methodology which allows us to unlock lots of kinds of things. I don't know, we can do, let's actually do something real here. It's always fun to do an actual computer experiment. Let me just um, see if we project this. If we can project this, then did a bag. That won't work because it can't magically, it has to, um, there we go. Push that in, maybe screw it in and that would be, let's see, did that work? Yes, something came up. Okay, well let's just for fun, let's, let's try, um, let us try, just, I'm going to, this is just, I'm just typing into Wolfen language, so let's say Van Gogh, let's see if it knows about see if it knows some. Um, okay, so Van Gogh is a person. Can you see this or should I make it bigger? Bigger. The, okay, so there's Van Gogh as a person. And let's say we say, you know, what are some notable artworks of Van Gogh? So it'll, it'll now have to go and, um, so this is just, uh, it'll, it'll go and find, okay, so there's, there's a bunch of notable artworks. So let's take a, um, now let's say, let's take a random sample of those notable artworks. Let's take, I don't know, 10 notable artworks there. Let's see if we can find, um, let's see if we have images for some of those. Um, okay, let's see what it does. Okay, so there are some images. And now maybe we can ask ourselves, you know, what, what colors were used in those? Um, so this is a very, very sciencey thing to ask, but let's say, you know, what colors were used in those pictures? So we can say, okay, that's the, that's the distribution in color space of what colors were used. Or we can, um, uh, maybe we could take those pictures and we could say. That would be very helpful to me because I'm colorblind, so. Okay, <laughs> well, so, told, okay so here's a good thing to do. <laughs> Look, here's a good thing to do then. The, the, let's take these pictures and let's see what happens if we take um, the ones on line five. Let's let us say, um, well, here, let, let's do something very straightforward. Let's, um, let's just binarize those pictures. Okay, so that's the black and white version of those pictures. Um, maybe we can actually, you, you're, are you a dichromat? In, um, uh, I'm called an an anomalous tritonope, but let's not use me as, as the subject. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. But we, we, could, we could start figuring out, given, given these pictures, we could start saying, let's, let's simulate how you would perceive these pictures based on, on your particular vision system. Um, and then we could start asking, you know, can you distinguish what, what um, uh, for, for example, we might take those pictures, they were on line five, and let's say, let's make, um, uh, I mean, I, the, um, this is, you know, let's use some machine learning method to try and figure out, it wasn't very exciting in this case, I was going to try and arrange these pictures in some kind of feature space where you could perhaps see, if you did this and you did it for all his pictures, you might be able to see some kind of progression of style. Yeah, let me, this I think is something that you may be able to do. Let's say, could you rank order the pictures on the range of color space that they have? How many different colors and so on? Sure, uh, let's uh, try that. Um, What's a bit of interest to me is that even though I'm colorblind, Rothko is my favorite, Mark Rothko is my favorite 20th century painter, and he's all color. But obviously, there's something about that which transcends the fact that I don't know what colors they are. Right, so I mean, we can, I don't know what, um, okay, so we seem to have some, so let's say, um, uh, let's just take the first 10 of those just for fun. Um, 
And let's, let's say, okay, so that we don't have so many images here, but let's, just for fun here, let's say, um, let's just delete the ones that were missing here, and let's say, what are the dominant colors? Okay, so this, this might be kind of an interesting thing to do. Let's, let's take the dominant colors in there, and now let's say, um, let's think how to do this. I can, I can find out what is the nearest, um, uh, for each of those colors, I can find out the nearest named color to those colors. Um, let me think how to do that. So um, I can't see, but are, the, are these Rothko's, and what's on the left there? Is that a Van Gogh? No, that's a Rothko, that, I think. Uh, I mean, it says it's a Rothko. It says it was a thing called Orbaud, Orbaid. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I mean, we could probably... Yeah, well, it's something not a Van Gogh. <laughs> I'll no. I'll give you that. Right. It's it's some... Um, but, but so now we've we figured out, you know, what are the dominant colors here? We could, for example, so, so for example, here's an interesting case of computational thinking that somebody might do. They might say, how can we help a person who is colorblind to appreciate this art, right? And what could we do? Well, we might want to turn this art into words. We might want to say, you know, be able to annotate each piece of art with the names of some colors as a way to, to give some indication of what's there. And then we might think, how would we do that? And somebody might say, well, what do we mean by the name of a color? Because this, that thing there, we could say what, um, you know, in, in this case, there are certain, there is a whole range of colors. If we just take that image there and we say, what's a chromaticity plot of that image? We'll find that there's a range of colors there. Okay, so in the color, color triangle, there's a range of colors. What is the color in that image? Well, now we have to get into sort of this question that might be sort of a computational thinking question of what do we mean by saying the dominant color in the image. Yes. And, and then, even if you didn't have it, if you formulated clearly enough, you could create a measure for chromaticity. Yes, yes. So, so for example, here, one easy thing we could do is if you want to know how diverse is the palette of colors, um, this would be a good indication. So for example, if we take our pictures here, well, let's actually take uh, line 5 and line 10, line 11, okay, so let's say uh, chromaticity plot, um, chromaticity plot of the stuff on line five, that was Van Gogh, actually let's do this. We're gonna do that for Van Gogh and for those Rothko pictures there, line 11, and what we're gonna find, I think, let's take a look. Okay, so this is, that's a comparison of the sort of color range for Van Gogh versus Rothko. Actually, it's not, not quite as broad for Van Gogh as I might have expected, but it's clearly, it's clearly somewhat broader than, than in the Rothko case. And we could kind of, you know, we could easily take that and turn it into some quantitative measure of these things and so on. Um, what Stephen has done, um, I hope he'll accept this characterization, actually is very meaningful for me because um, I'm a psychologist by training, and when I was 15 or 16, I wasn't getting my doctorate in physics, uh, my uncle gave me a psychology textbook. He must have had a sense that I was interested in that, and I became fascinated by the Ishihara color plates because people who can see colors say, well, that's 23. To me, it looks like nothing. And uh, one of the powerful things about Stephen's work, and we're getting into education by this example, is he doesn't start with what the textbooks say kids should be interested in or what the teacher says, but he starts with what kids are interested in, the questions they bring up, and then he tries to figure out a way to help them answer the question, and in the process, introducing them to categories and to analyses which they may or may not have thought of on their own. Um, and uh, you know, I listen to a lot of uh, music, classical music, and uh, often, um, I can't tell exactly who the composer is, but I know approximately when it was done. And I also have pretty strong views about whether it's any good. And it'd be wonderful to know whether, you know, my, my judgment of quality, I say, look, this is clearly a classical piece. I don't think it's Mozart, it might be Haydn, it, but it's also not uh, uh, Solari, you know. And, uh, you know, we, doesn't, we don't know that the, that the computational approach could answer the question, but it might, be, it might well be able to. It's surprising, I mean, that type of thing of classifying, like, you know, which instrument is playing in a piece of sound, for example. It, with sort of modern machine learning, it is remarkably easy to answer questions like that, yeah. to classify things. Um, and uh, it's, it's remarkable the cues that end up being, I mean, if I just say, here, we could, we could take, um, let's do this, let's get, a, um, let's get a, an image from my computer. Let's, there we go, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, <laughs> an image from the computer we could say, uh, image identify um, 
that image, and now this is just a simple case. I don't know what it's going to say here. It may say something goofy because it's seeing all kinds of background and so on here, but it might say it's a person, it might say it's a... Okay, that's interesting. Okay, so let's, let's try. It said it's a cockpit. That's very, that's very strange. Let, let's, let's ask it, um, um, just for fun, let's ask it, what were the probabilities that it assigned? This is, this is the world of machine learning, that, that like humans, AIs make mistakes. And, and those are fascinating. Because yes. you say, why did it say that? Yeah, well, so, so a, a really interesting thing to do. Let's, let's try doing this. Let's try feeding it those Rothko pictures as, as things to identify what are, what are they and see what it says there. Let's see, what is it doing here? Wake up, computer. There we go. Okay, so it says it's a cockpit with 27%. It's a primate with 27%. It's a hominid. Again, a person. Okay, the, the person has almost made it. The cockpit just beat out the person. It's an awning deck um, and uh, a variety of other things here. But it's kind of as a, as a matter of psychology. Actually, when we were building this image identifier, one of the things I like to do is to feed it abstract art because it's a way of telling whether it's prejudiced. For example, for a while it was saying that almost any piece of abstract art was a Band-Aid, which is kind of a weird and you know it means something is wrong with the way it's it's uh, it's thinking about things and so on. Okay, great. So uh, there's a question we we like to ask in the work that I do. If you were the czar of a university, uh, we we, you, we'll, we can remain nameless, and you could reconfigure the curriculum. Um, in I mean, let's take let, let, let's take Harvard as an example. Harvard has for years been humanities social sciences, natural sciences. And uh, you know, within humanities, there's you know, um, the arts, English, uh, history, linguistics sometimes. And within social sciences, it, from sociology to anthropology to economics, and then you have natural and physical sciences. And roughly speaking, that's what's done um, in certainly in most liberal arts schools in this country. Um, would you keep those categories, or would you shake them up? And if so, how? You know, it's a funny thing. How fields are defined is complicated. I mean, so one question is, when you talk about computational thinking and the role of that paradigm, you know, like there is, OK, so let's talk about math and what's happened with math. So math, rather cleverly, figured out that there's this area of pure mathematics that's this abstract, you know, intellectual area that is worth pursuing. The, OK, let's go back to the Middle Ages. There were two competing kind of formal systems, logic and math. Um, as we notice in sort of the development of education, math is done today, and kids learn math. Logic, not so much. It's not really a thing. I think one of the differences is that math ended up building this kind of uh, quite a substantial kind of independent abstract field that was pure mathematics. Logic didn't so much build that. Um, it ends up that you know, the support of pure mathematics as a worthwhile thing to do is largely a consequence of the fact that there are applications of mathematics that have flowed out into different areas. But there's also this pure abstract thinking kind of activity that is pure mathematics that is a worthwhile sort of piece of intellectual heritage that our, our culture has. I think that you know, we can ask about computational thinking, how should that be? You know, when, when it comes to math, there's this area of pure math that's really, really good and clean and intellectual. There's applied math, which people don't completely know what it is. You know, applied math as a department at universities has had a troubled history. It was, you know, after the Second World War, it was mostly differential equations and linear programming. Then it sort of evolved into different things. It's been, it's not really clear what it means to be applied math. There is this pure area of, of, of intellectual work that is math, and then there are the, well, it gets applied to different things. For computation and computational thinking, there is also, I think, a sort of basic science of computation that is, uh, actually not so much studied. It's not quite the same thing as computer science. And there's a, a small piece of, of thing that should exist there, much like pure mathematics. And Turing would have been an example of someone who did that, Alan Turing. Uh, yes, I mean, I, I would say he was, a, he was at Shannon. the beginning of yeah. that. Yes, yes, right. These are abstract ideas about computation. Um, so, you know, there's a pure computational science that deserves to be its own separate thing, like there's a department of pure mathematics, so to speak. And then there are the applications of that to all different areas, and those things should be part of those areas. So, in other words, you, t let me just make sure that I'm understanding you. You wouldn't change the topography particularly, but you would 
um, open it up to, pro to computing ways of thinking, uh, and they would go as far as they yeah. could go. Well, that's because a lot of these things, they will be called computational sociology, right. computational art history. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be called that, you know. And, and this question of how we divide knowledge into the things that we choose to teach, that's an interesting question in its own right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, it's kind of like the, uh, uh, there are all kinds of things, and, you know, how do you estimate how many departments there might be in a university? It's like, how do you estimate on the back of an envelope how many countries there should be in the world? How do you estimate, you know, these are, it's not easy to know that there should be, uh, you know, maybe it's more a matter of, of uh, something to do with the way that we humans sort of choose to organize ourselves that there end up being whatever it is, you know, 50 to, uh, to 150 or something, I don't know quite what the number is of sort of different fields that, um, that typically get taught at universities. I, mean, I think another question is, you know, as we look at the, the progress of technology, you know, what technology tries to do is to automate things getting done. And then there's a the question of, okay, so what do we teach the humans in a time when there's this sort of rising tide of automation? And what do we, uh, um, and you know, we could still be teaching flint napping, but we're not. Because that the things that, or, you know, or a lot of other kinds of very manual operations that have long ago been sort of submerged by technology. And I think one of the things that's interesting is, is there more that needs to be taught in the world today? Or is it that there is a, a continually a frontier of, of things that are worth humans learning that haven't yet been automated? And then as we automate more, we can sort of teach higher level kinds of things for the humans, so to speak, and leave the lower level things to just get done by, by machines. And I think that uh, you know, one of the things that comes up right now is this question of, okay, so you know, what should we teach? Well, we should teach, you know, we're, we're getting very powerful tools for achieving lots of kinds of things in the world. But the one thing we don't get to sort of automate is defining, so what is it that we're trying to achieve? You know, the, the definition of what our goals are is something that I think inevitably has to come from, from us humans. But no, but isn't the fear that much of artificial intelligence will actually presuppose certain goals, whether or not the um, users of it are aware of it. I mean, let's just take you know, cars and you know, what they do when there's a, a potential accident. There has to be something built into that system which decides, you know, do they hit three people or do they, do they, does, the, right. does, does the driver uh, sacrifice himself? Because, so um, we could, I, mean, I would say, and I guess you would say, I'm not sure I want to leave that to the uh, the algorithm, but most people won't say that. They'll just do whatever is built into their car system. Yeah. Right, but I mean, you know, and what all we're doing here is, it's a question, you know, there's, there's this very powerful thing that is computation. And, you know, computation can do all kinds of things, but we have to tell it what we want it to do. You know, there's, you can, you know, one of the things I particularly like is um, uh, being able to just sort of go out into the computational universe of possible programs and just say, what does a typical program do? So I, I have to, you know, one of my all-time favorites, this is um, it's a very simple program. There's, there's kind of the rules for the program. And if we say, well, what does this particular program do? We can just say, let's run this program, starting off from just one black dot at the beginning. Let's see. Um, the uh, uh, and um, oops, the uh, we can just um, uh, we're just using using this program and running it, um, and that's what it does. And so this is you know even though the rules that we started off from are these very simple rules, the thing we get is something that looks complicated and in many ways quite random. This is this is your new kind of science. Yes, this yeah. is this is this is yeah. this is this is kind of my analog my very junior analog of the kind of, you know, being Galileo and seeing the moons of Jupiter, so to speak, and realizing that there was something that existed in the world that wasn't what you expected. And this is, this is the thing for me, which is, uh, you know, there can be a very simple rule that produces very complicated behavior. And I think this is a lot about how nature makes the things it makes. Um, but uh, one of the things that, um, uh, you know, and there's sort of a basic science of exploring what's out there in this computational universe. So earlier, we, we, we talked a bit before um, the, this, this uh, public session, and you used the word constitution. Um, and of course, I immediately thought about the United States Constitution, um, which is pretty important. And then I thought about Antonin Scalia, who claimed that he was an originalist. Um, and uh, you know, many of us sort of 
doubt that he was an originalist, that he kind of decided what he wanted to do and then found. But if, if one wanted to think about that question, if you were actually, if, if uh, Scalia, may he rest in peace, were to come to you and say, I want to figure out what the Constitution really meant about things, uh, how would you think about that? Well, let's, let's talk about it. Let me, let me just, th this, this thought about kind of computation and, uh, you know, the thing we learn from the science is that there's a lot of powerful stuff that is easily at hand in the computational universe. The challenge for us humans is what do we choose to do with it? And, you know, as a person who spent a lot of my life designing a language for communicating with machines, uh, the, you know, the thing that I view that language as achieving is sort of being a bridge between the way we think about things and what we can get our computers to do. Now, one of the questions that comes up is, okay, if we're going to build for the future and define sort of how AIs are going to work and how the trolley problem is going to be solved by the car and things like this, we, we ultimately need to tell, tell the AIs what we want them to do. The AIs are capable of doing all kinds of stuff, all kinds of things that we can't see the point of it all, all kinds of things, you know, we could run, computation can do, can, can generate all kinds of complex things which they just, they are what they are, we may not care about them and so on. You know, our challenge is to say, what do we actually want the AIs to do? And one of the things that then comes up is, okay, so how do you explain some concept like, okay, AIs, be nice to humans? You know, how do you explain that concept? You have to have some way to go from, you know, inside the AI, it's doing something a bit like this. I mean, I could show you what's happening inside that image identifier, and it'll just be a bunch of bits flapping around. And the question is, how does one, you know, how does one then explain a concept like be nice to humans? And this is a, this is a question of sort of the computationalization of an area of, of, uh, of human endeavor. It's actually one that Leibniz was very interested in. Leibniz's original goal, he was originally trained as a lawyer, and his original goal was to sort of turn every legal argument into something where you could compute who was oh. right and who was wrong. Um, that turned out he was 300 years too early for that. Um, we are just coming to the point where we are starting to be able to do that. And it's something of great relevance in the modern world of cryptocurrencies and smart contracts and things like this to be able to express, to be able to represent um, the, the kinds of things that one might write in a legal document as something like code that is in some way executable. So, you know, one of the challenges, are, you know, talking about the what should we tell the AIs to do? What should we, how should we tell them to sort of globally act? Um, I think what we end up having to do is write something which is more like a kind of constitution than it is like our traditional notion of a program. And that's kind of the, you know, one of the challenges is how do we, how do we express these things which are important values to us humans in a way that sort of bridges sort of the, the abstract computation. But if I understand you correctly, one could then still ask the same question of this computer-generated constitution, namely, um, yeah, what does it literally say and as opposed to how expansive it is? Yeah, right. So, so I mean, one of, one of the issues is, given a set of rules, what consequences can they have? And, it's and how kind broadly of become, are they applied? Yeah, but, but also, I mean, you know, one of the consequences of Gödel's theorem and what we now know about universal computation is, in a sense, in any system that isn't trivial, there will always be kind of unintended consequences. I mean, put in terms of, um, you know, in terms of this did kind get, of thing. Did you get that, guys? If you, if you didn't understand Gödel's theorem <laughs> until yeah, now. That, that, that's a, another version of it, which you is... You had a nervous breakdown, but you, get it, you did it very well. <laughs> um, it's, you know, if, when you look at a picture like this and you say, what's going to happen? If I ran this for a million steps, what would happen? So one answer, one, one way to know that is just run it for a million steps and see what happens. There's a question of, can you figure out in advance? Can we, as sort of smarter humans, figure out what's going to happen, know whether this will ever die out or whatever else without having to actually run it? There's a phenomenon I call computational irreducibility that implies that in general you can't do that, and it's closely related to Gödel's theorem and so on. And it's kind of it's the same thing when you set up a set of constraints that are saying, well, we want the AIs to be nice to humans, and that means, among other things, that this should happen and this should happen and this should happen. It it is it is it is inevitable that when you set up some set of constraints, that there will always be some unintended consequences. It's a consequence of computational irreducibility that that will happen. So one of the interesting questions, for example, for you know, just sort of thinking it through for sort of an AI constitution is, okay, if the AI constitution is in place 
and the AIs are acting according to it, then we don't want the AIs to be able to change the Constitution, do we? Because then, then um, we'd kind of end up with uh, uh, then something that we didn't intend to happen would happen. But on the other hand, if we say, well, let's set this constitution now Then there will be unintended, unintended ones which we, which we then have to adjust to. If right, 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 right. And it's also, um, and so it's, it's kind of interesting to see, uh, you know, when you look at the actual constitutions that exist around the world, you know, I, one of the questions is how do constitutions get changed? And it's like, well, there's the sort of super democracy scheme, there's the supreme ruler scheme, and then my favorite, which seemed to, from my interpretation, was kind of some of the Soviet style ones, was it's almost undecidable what will happen. There's a, there's a, a depth of bureaucracy so great that you can't figure out whether it's possible to ever get to to the end of the, of the process. Um, but that's, that's um, uh, Gödel thought he had found a bug, actually, in the US Constitution. He thought he had found a, a way in which the US could become a dictatorship. And that was... Um, well, we're, we're testing that now. <laughs> um, anyway, I would love to continue in this vein, but I would like to move a bit closer to um, education for younger people. And you have children yourself. Indeed. Um, to what extent were your children, did your children learn different things in different ways from the way that uh, your generation did? I mean, let's not talk about you particularly, but... Uh, oh, I think my children, I have four children, so I have four data points. <laughs> and um, the, uh, I think um, uh, probably some of my children inherited from me a certain degree of unteachability, <laughs> um, which is, I'm, I'm one of these people who... who um, uh, I like figuring out stuff for myself. I'm not sure, you know, when I was a kid, one of the things that I sort of unwittingly did was, you know, I wasn't interested in doing exercises in textbooks because they'd been done before, but I figured that there were problems that were fairly close to those that were more interesting because nobody had done those before. And I sort of thought, okay, let me try and do these. Well, did you make up these questions or were these just questions that, as far as you could tell, hadn't been answered? No, I made up those you questions. Made I made them up. I mean, that, yeah. that, that's, you know, it's kind of the, the um, and so I think um, some of my children might have inherited. Yeah. Well, an analogy is if you play an instrument, you could simply play just the stuff that's been written, or you could begin to, you know, improvise, et cetera. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. I think I have, of my four children, one of whom is, that they're all still sort of in being educated. But, but um, as I think I'm still being educated, but they're, they're young enough that they're officially being educated. All right, so I'm a parent but, too, and, and, a grand, and four, prime, four, four kids, four grandkids. Um, let's forget about teaching them uh, subjects, but how about you know, uh, teaching them about life, like being nice and so on? Do you think about that in a, in a way that's different than most people do? Do you have a sense of that? Uh, I don't know, the only thing, my, my kids happen to have been exposed enough to what I do that they kind of got the idea that, you know, I think one of the things that's sort of sometimes amusing to them, and um, it's like, I'll have some crazy idea. I, I have ideas, you know, I've, I've my, my sort of uh, way of living is I run a company that I've been running for 31 years now, and it's, you know, it's 800 people or something, and I view it as being sort of a machine for turning ideas that I have into real things in the world. Um, and so, you know, every day I have ideas, and some of those ideas, they start off as kind of some crazy idea, and then, you know, they turn into something real in the world. Now, it turns out the computation and sort of this whole sort of computational paradigm I found to be an incredibly efficient you know, vehicle for turning ideas into real things in the world. It's something not just for me, but for everybody else. And, but, but I think one of the things that perhaps my kids might have noticed is for them, it's kind of a natural thing that one can just have an idea and then it will turn into a thing in the world where there are you know, websites and everything and you know, people talking about it and all that kind of thing. So I think that's a, you know, if anything, that's a sort of a meta. Um, well, let's, let me, let me um, make this somewhat less intellectual. Let's say there's a kid, could be anybody's kid, who's very unhappy because the other kids are shunning him or her. Um, and you know, the kid cries a lot and you're actually worried that the kid may you know, be get, get depressed. Um, how do you think about that as a parent or as an analyst? Uh, but you know, uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much less happy story than you should be able to develop ideas and create uh, uh, programs. For. You know, I, okay, so fortunately my particular kids have uh, rather 
happy kids, but, but I'm happy to say. But, but so I haven't had to confront yeah. that particular issue. But, but I think that the, um, uh, so you know, I, I have been interested in sort of people and how people sort of evolve in the world. I'm one of those kinds of people who's kept track of what happens to everybody they went to kindergarten with pretty much. Um, because I view that as my longest baseline kind of data on how people develop. And I've also been, you know, as a person who's been trying to build up a sort of talented team of people, I've been really interested sure. in kind of how do you how do you find talent in the world, and then how do you how do you match up? And I, and I view one of the things that I'm I'm often interested in is you know there's a there's a set of things that people are are good at doing, and there's a set of things that are to be done in the world today. And it's kind of this interesting puzzle of how do you fit together the set of things that people are good at doing with the niches that exist today. I mean, you can be unlucky and you can be, you know, a perfect match for being, you know, a, a traditional pirate or something, but, you know, you lived at the wrong time in history. Or you can be, you know, a perfect match for building a computational knowledge system and you can live in the time of Leibniz. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's a certain degree of luck, but there's also a question of, you know, given a, um, uh, given one's sort of intrinsic interests and abilities, you know, there's kind of how do you solve that puzzle? I think one of the things that I see as being, um, you know, I'm, I'm curious about this and I've, I've uh, it's sort of a, a hobby of mine to try and understand how one can help kids in particular to understand what is the thing that is the great match for them. So I'm going to pretend to be that kid and you're going to say, you know, Dad, um, I try so hard to play with the kids on the playground and, you know, Johnny played with me, but he's moved. And when I try to play uh, with them, they just don't want to play with me and they've, they're starting to tease me and, you know, I'm really unhappy. I don't want to go to school anymore. Um, how would you think about that? Well, I mean, for me, it would be like, well, what do you actually want to do? If you have nothing, you know, if you, were, if you have your, your free day when you're not at school, what are you going to do? So if you give me an answer, I can start okay, well, to build I want, I want to play with friends. I want, I want to play ball. And they don't want to play ball with me. The, OK, I'm the wrong guy to ask this question. <laughs> <laughs> we did confess neither of us follow sports. Yeah, but, right. But I, I think what but, you're saying is you've got, you got to find what, what motivates the child that also he has more control over, because we don't know why the other kids aren't playing. Right. I mean, yeah. like, for example, in my own life. So I've been, you know, I'm not a professor, for example. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I you know, I'm basically, I don't think there's any job, you know, being a CEO is something that I've done for a long time, and I'm probably somewhat competent at it. But I don't think that in a, you know, will the other kids want to play ball? My strategy is I'm just going to build my own thing where I can play whatever ball I want, <laughs> rather, than, rather than have to, you know, exist in an environment. So I'm probably the wrong person to ask that particular scenario. Okay. Um, <laughs> I do want to ask just a couple more things about your, about the one of six people, the, uh, the, edu the educator, Stephen. Um, you have a summer program. Yes. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, actually, we have two main summer programs. One is a summer school for kind of adults and others, and the other is a summer camp for high school students. So the summer school um, has been running for 15 years now. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of, we end up getting this very interesting collection of people from around the world. It's a three-week thing. And kind of our goal is to get people to do an interesting project about some topic. And uh, kind of my role in the whole thing is uh, I'm doing sort of the extreme professoring thing of going through. We had, I think, 77 people this, this year. And it's like for each one, OK, what topic, you know, what project should they do? And it's been very satisfying over the, over the years because a bunch of the projects that ended up getting sort of picked out for people in these summer schools have turned into whole careers. Right. Um, and uh, Can you give uh, one or two examples? Yeah, I mean, there's a, even from the very first summer school we had, there was a, 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 um, a, a thing where studying, I mean, there's a kind of mathy thing where we were studying um, kind of uh, uh, particular kind of sequences that are rather unusual, and the, the, a particular person got really interested By in that. By sequences, you mean? Uh, mathematical sequences. Like, like prime I could, numbers I, or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, right. Well, actually, actually, as it happened, this was a sequence that nobody would have expected to make primes, but it did. And so that ended up being a whole, whole sort of career thing. What's, Actually, the, what's, the, what's the career? 
You, are they prime, an, an area, prime minister? An, an area of math. I have to say, an, an area of math. Actually, I'll, I'll tell you an example. Prime of, minister, but the, actually, one of my this is not from our summer school, but in terms of the people's niches in the world and so on, one of my one of the things that's always interesting about sort of doing new things is that you you find that there are new niches for people that you didn't know exist. So, for example, I always like it when there's a new job just job category that just didn't exist before. So, like one that's common for us now is a linguistic curator. So that's when we when we have to figure out, uh, you know, for for Wolf Malfa or for Siri and so on, when people say something, what does what does that mean? So, for example, for all the companies that exist in the world, what are all the names by which these companies are known? And this is kind of an area. And so, you know, we used to have a test. I don't think we probably use this anymore, but it's like, you know, how many ways are there to give uh, change for 35 cents or something? And there are many, many, many different ways to say that. And some people are really good at coming up with all those different ways to say it. They don't necessarily know they have the skill, um, but it's sort of an interesting and fun thing when, when you realize that there are these things that some people are really good at, and the people who've had a, you know, a great time with us being linguistic curators, they really enjoy it. They didn't know that that was a, a skill that, um, uh, that, that existed. I have to say, my, my all-time favorite example of that from many years ago um, was, uh, I was here, I'll show you an example. Um, if you have a graph, a network, so let's say we have um, a network and it's, um, it's got a bunch of nodes and it's connected and so on. There's a question of how do you lay out a network like that? Well, we've now got machines to do it fairly well. Um, this particular network is random, so it doesn't look like much. Um, but uh, uh, back uh, many years ago, I, for my new kind of science book, I needed to lay out a bunch of networks. So I wanted to find a person who was good at graph detangling. Okay? So we ran this ad and we were trying to find you know, some student or something who would be good at graph detangling. And most people were really pretty bad at it. We just gave them a test and they were pretty bad at it. It was this one young woman who, was, uh, who turned out to be really good at it. And so you know, she worked for us for a short while doing graph detangling. So it was like, okay, what happened to her? Turns out she does uh, kind of exotic, innovative knitting patterns and has a whole company and career based on, based she's on a, doing- She's a knitwit. Right. Something like that, but a, a, de a detangler of, um, you know, but so that's a, that's a particular kind of skill that, that this particular person happened to have that was a, um, but, but anyway, back to, our, back to our summer school. I think the thing that is, that um, maybe I'll talk about the summer camp, which was for yeah. high school students. Um, I should say the summer school, we just added a track for educators, which has been quite successful. Um, and uh, uh, that's something that um, for people to kind of learn about, um, these kinds of tools and computational thinking. So when you say so educators, are these K-12 teachers or? They've been a mixture of yeah. K-12. And, and do they come uh, from certain disciplines or are they across the board? Across the board. That's no good. Kind, because of, they, uh, kind of random collection. But okay, so the summer camp, which we've only been doing for five years now, that's kind of an interesting case because um, it's, uh, it's a two week summer camp and most of the kids come in knowing rather little about computation and programming. It is a surprising thing, despite all of this emphasis on you know, coding education and so on. I mean, I think, by the way, coding education is sort of the enemy of computational thinking in the, same, in the following sense. I mean, what tends to be, you know, coding education tends to be, let's try and write some kind of uh, sort of detailed code in some fairly low level language that kind of describes to a computer in detail what it should do. It's not, let's take sort of some computational idea and let's sort of explore that computational idea. It's let's do the mechanics of how the code works. I mean, it's, it's sort of like, let's understand, you know, we're not so much interested in driving the car, we're more interested in going inside the engine and looking at the details of, of how to put together the, you know, the pistons and so on. Now, you know, the thing which has happened in, in sort of coding education, it's gone through multiple waves with multiple different technologies and so on. The thing that I'm most concerned about actually is I hope it isn't too successful because otherwise what it runs the risk of happening is that kids will conclude, okay, so when you look at math, one of the really bad things that kids conclude about their experience of learning math in school is math is kind of boring and is not for them. Um, I mean, that's sort of a meta thing they, you know, some fraction don't discover that, but some rather large fraction discover that. Um, and I think with kind of the sort of low level coding and so on, it is as mechanical as a lot of the kind of math that kids find boring. Um, and it sort of runs the risk if you, you know, computational thinking is the kind of thing I've been sort of illustrating here is a, is a really quite 
different kind of thing. You know, if we were to go down to the sort of lowest levels of, you know, what happens inside a computer and we were to say, let's go, you know, figure out what's going on with binarizing pictures and so on, that's a whole, you know, that's, that's a week of writing code in some low-level language to be able to do that. And that's a very different activity than thinking about what does it mean to, you know, to turn a picture from being colored to black and white and so on. So I think that the, but anyway, what we find, so what we've done, I, I should have a good example, let's see, I wonder where it is, um, of, uh, so anyway, we have these students, I think we had like 45 this year in our, in our summer camp, and sort of the goal is to go from zero knowledge of computation and computational thinking to the point where they have a decent degree of fluency. And what I mean by fluency is given a question that they might ask, like one of the ones we were just asking here, can they just sit down and be able to answer that question for themselves? Can they get a reasonable start at being fluent enough with computational thinking and with the tools to be able to go from thought that they have to actual execution and, um, and implementation? Let me try to paraphrase what you've done, and then I'd like to open it up for some questions from the floor. What you, I would paraphrase what you've just said. Um, I think it's easier to teach coding from the point of view of the teacher because there's a right and wrong answer. Once you get to computational thinking, it's, um, you know, there, it's a question of what satisfies for the answer, and that's more challenging, and it means you have to have, it's a, I mean, to use the ed, ed jargon, you have to have a more progressive approach to education rather than the testing right-wrong kind of. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things I've noticed is that, you see, one of the very nice things is you could write a computational essay here. We could say, you know, there's a section heading, okay, making, you know, pictures black and white. Um, and then we could say, you know, what do we do? You know, we could, we could write some text here. I think this is a very interesting medium for sort of what kids can actually do is they are, you know, you might have some prompt that says, you know, figure out how a colorblind person might perceive these pictures, then you can go and do various things, and you write, it's a mixture of kind of narrative text together with a lot of kind of, um, uh, together with expressing your thoughts in, in a computational language, and then sort of having this sort of uh, power of the computer kind of filling in the, the, the facts, so to speak. Now, a computational essay, how do you grade a computational essay? It's kind of like the way you might grade an essay essay. Um, I, I think it's something where, you know, and many of the criteria are like, is it clear and what it's saying? You know, what, um, it's actually probably easier to structure a computational essay than to structure, to sort of learn structure in a computational essay than an ordinary essay. But yes, I agree with you that, that the, the, I mean, you can, you can answer the question I mean, what, what's interesting about computational thinking is how open-ended it can be. And, you know, one of the things that I find, um, for example, in our summer camp, summer school, I usually start them off by doing some kind of live experiment where I will say, okay, you know, in the next hour, we're going to discover something interesting that's never been discovered before, okay? And, and so far, it's always worked, mm -hmm. discovered something. And, um, you know, and, that, and the very fact that that's possible is really an important very thing. Very exciting. Right. Yeah, and I guess uh, um, there's no reason why you couldn't have a program which also grades the computational essay. Um, and then the question is, you know, how, how, drac how, draconing, how draconian is it? Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, so, so, you know, like, for example, in this, I wrote a book about Wolfram language that has, um, uh, that has, let's see, I probably have, you know, we can, we can probably, um, uh, you know, okay, so that, you know, the book would have, let's look at the section on colors, for example, you know, it has exercises, and actually there's a MOOC version of this book as well, but, but um, uh, let's see how this works, okay, so let's see, answer and check your solution, okay, so we can, we can type in code here, and we have actually, it's, it's rather high tech, we have an auto grading system that can recognize whether the program is both doing the right thing and, um, uh, and is um, uh, and whether the program is is kind of just sort of assuming the answer and so on, and also whether the program is copy pasted from from someplace on the web. We 
we have ways <laughs> to tell that. Um, but what's, and what's interesting about programs is that they are sort of a, unlike math, where the answer might be 17 or something, programs are a more creative kind of thing mm. to produce because, in fact, the right answers won't always be the same. There are a wide range of programs which will all be, you know, in somewhat different styles, but will all achieve the objective which was defined. And so I think that that's some, and, and as I say, it happens to be possible to autograde you know, programs, it's somewhat more difficult than autograding, you know, math where the answer might be, you know, it's multiple choice where the answer is 17 or something. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I think, but, but in general, you know, I view what's great about sort of, uh, you know, writing like Wolfram language code, so to speak, is it is, it's an expressive language like English is an expressive language. And it's one where, for example, kids, uh, who you know get quite fluent. I mean, for example, for myself, I'm fluent enough in it, and one of my kids is more fluent even than I am, which is which is always uh, always always interesting. But you know, you can start typing code long before I could tell you what the code is going to going to say. Actually, the most extreme thing that I've seen in some 11-year-olds, I guess they they were, who've been studying Wolfram language, they were like, you know, like it's nice to meet them, and they start. They start saying programs. Yeah, you, should, you, should, you should tell them what that sounds like. I don't, I don't think I can do it. I can't do but, that. But can't. you were doing that before. Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I could take one of these. Um, it's like pig Latin, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, much, right. Much I mean, I could, I could say um, something like, um, okay, uh, you know. Yeah, I, I can't do it. I, it's just, a, it's like, you know, map dominant colors over whatever. Actually, it's something that we've realized for, for some education purposes that it's actually important to be able to say code. Because when you tell somebody, oh, you didn't do that quite right, it should be this, you have to be able to say it. And it's, you know, what we're doing effectively in Wolfram language, you know, the reason that we can make this language that is, it's actually like, like human languages, it's easier to read than to write. And you can take some piece of code that's been written, and it's you know it's easy. I don't know. Let's let's just do as one one example before we you know just to say let's get okay. Let's get a list of words in English. Let's do something like let's take the first letter from uh, from each of those words, and let's like make a word. So that's like um, how many times? Let's make a word cloud of. Uh, of that. So this is going to show us effectively a word cloud of what the most common letters, like if we, if we looked at a dictionary, we'd find the S section of the dictionary was thicker than, you know, the K section or something like that, and that shows us. But if we look at this, you know, we can sort of understand it's a word cloud of taking something from a string and it's a word list, and we're kind of leveraging the fact that there is, you know, that, we're, that, we, that we know English to be able to, uh, to, to understand what, what's going on computationally. And you know, this gets more exotic when you start to have, when you, you can shorten this code and have various kinds of, kinds of other constructs in it that are a little bit more sophisticated than this. Um, and that's what, that's what these kids could do that I, I can't readily you know, do <laughs> verbally, so to speak. Great. Um, so we have about a half an hour. I have a couple of final questions to ask uh, Stephen. But the floor is open. Don't be shy. And don't be verbose. <laughs> okay, we have several people getting up. Why don't you start, and then we'll, we'll, we'll go table tennis. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Ben Bolger. I'm a Harvard alum. And uh, there's a period in time where uh, rote thinking was highly valued, the ability to just memorize things. And now we've gone to a period where I think a critical analysis uh, is more valued in education. And I'm just wondering, for the future, uh, as we perhaps emphasize more computational thinking, what does, if, if, if retaining information, memorization is not as valued, and critical analysis itself is evolved into computational thinking, what does it mean to be intelligent uh, in, a, in, a, in a new era? So, you know, in terms of the should you know stuff, Yes, it's really worthwhile to know stuff. I mean, I'm lucky enough that I have a good memory, and so I just know a bunch of stuff about a bunch of areas, and that's really useful. And the idea that one should sort of remove knowing stuff from education, I think, is crazy. Um, and uh, you know, whether it's um, whether you have to know stuff by rote memorizing it, or whether you uh, have a good enough memory that you just sort of absorb it, that's a different issue. In terms of what does it mean to uh, I don't know quite what, um, how to formulate it. I mean, I, I think um, in the, the question of 
uh, sort of there are there are patterns of thinking that are, it's worth that, that there are just things to know about how to think about different kinds of things. There are patterns of thinking that it's worth learning. I'm not sure. I don't know how to answer. That, that's a that's a more global question that I'm not, I'm, I think I may know how to answer immediately. Do you have any? Can you can you crispen that? Um, um, I think that when you talk about it's good to know a lot of stuff, and then you invoke your memory. Uh, probably in the 21st century is, is if you don't have a good memory, you have to know how quickly how to access it from some kind of a site. But um, it's probably the case that, it's, as I think this gentleman is, is implying, um, living by your wits, which means coming up with new questions and figuring out things that, that can't easily be um, uh, you know, be automated is relatively more important in a um, yeah. in an age where almost anything that can be mechanized or simply simply computed is um, how this um, how this translates into what goes on in the classroom from a young age or indeed what goes on in child rearing from a young age uh, there probably are huge differences across societies across demographies and across teaching philosophies um, and uh, and, uh, you know, we yeah, I mean, look, I have, I have prejudices because of the way that, for example, I learn. Like, I learn best by actually figuring stuff out for myself, right? Not true of everybody. Um, and, you know, so for me, I would sort of project that onto the world as saying, you know, people should just figure out what they want to know about and then learn about, you know, how to do the mechanics of, of, of figuring that out. Um, I doubt that that would work for, you know, you know, all people. Um, so I, I think I, I've, um, um, you know, in, in terms of, um, I think, you know, people need a certain set of skills. One of those skills is how to do computational thinking. Computational thinking happens to be a really powerful skill that, you know, those of us who build tools are trying to make that skill ever more, ever more of a powerful skill. You know, you have to have that ability as yourself to sort of formulate, to structure your thinking to the point where you can explain it to a sufficiently smart computer. Then it's kind of our job to make that computer ever smarter and smarter, um, and to leverage that skill to make that skill more and more useful um, in, in the world. Thank you. Now, see, this is a good computing thinking because. The woman saw that the line was longer here, so she went over there. <laughs> Hi, Stephen. Uh, my name is Noah Heller. I teach math teachers here at the Graduate School of Education. I should first thank you, one, for being here, also for helping me get through multivariable calculus however many years ago. Um, the question I have is, in math education, a critique, a, a very real critique of math education is that we're teaching students how to answer questions that they haven't yet asked. And watching you engineer your language, it was remarkable to see you not just fluently use a language, but also ask meaningful questions. And I wonder if in your work with students um, or in your work developing this language, you've thought about how to promote question asking so that people are simultaneously learning a language that I'm curious in terms of technical skill, your critique of the way that programming is being taught, I wonder if, if if that's avoidable, in the same way that we teach math in order to ask questions someday. Um, so can you learn this, right. can so, you learn Wolfram simultaneously with asking meaningful questions? Right, so I think the first thing about asking questions is you've got to see other people, you've got to see it be something where people are figuring out questions to ask. So, you know, my, I don't really know because I haven't spent time in enough classrooms, but, you know, my, impression is that a lot of classroom teaching ends up being teacher thinks they know everything, so to speak, and is feeding that to students, so to speak. In the world of sort of computational thinking and particularly kind of live computational exploration, uh, it, the, it, the situation is a bit different because as you start doing things, you are routinely, you know, discovering stuff that Teacher won't know, maybe no human knows. It's never been seen before. And so even by illustrating the doing of that for students, I think that's a very kind of liberating and empowering 
thing to see. That is, that you can just go and, you know, you can explore in different directions. You know, a thing I've done, so I've done a bunch of things. You know, I, I live in Concord, Massachusetts, and I have a little, little effort to teaching some middle schoolers there because I like to do actual field work on the stuff I'm talking about. Um, to, uh, uh, and, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, this is kind of child-directed exploration, right? And they're like, what about this? What about that? And they get the idea very quickly that it's possible to ask questions because normally you ask a question and okay, maybe you just don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer or there's nothing very interesting to explore. But once you see that it's possible to take the question they ask, do some computational thinking to formulate it in a way that is feedable to a computer, then they're kind of empowered to say, well, now I wonder about this, now I wonder about that. And the problem, which I don't understand in terms of classroom management, is what you end up with very quickly is a stack of 10 questions. And um, you know, that's great, because you know, then, then you're off and running and you know, questions are being asked. But yeah, I think, I think the first step is just let students see this kind of open exploration process. And you know, it's, a, it's for a teacher, so you know, there are many people other than me who can do live programming with Wolfram language. Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, for example, one of my kids is better at it than I am. So it's, it's um, uh, I think that the, um, uh, but I think this process of, you know, let's just go and explore and we've got this tool and, and what's interesting about the tool is that you can do enough quickly enough that people you know, stay interested and that the questions people ask are like, okay, it's gonna take five or 10 minutes to answer that question. It's not like we have to go to a library and we have to go you know, sifting through books or websites or whatever to be, able to, to be able to answer that question. So that's my, I mean, I think it's a very, um, uh, you know, I completely agree with you that the formulating the question thing um, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful skill to teach. I mean, it's, you know, when we look at a lot of fields um, in, for example, in academia, uh, you know, there are people who are mechanically very good at doing something, but the people who end up being probably the most successful academics tend to be the ones who are good at formulating what should be done, you know, uh, aren't, you know addressing what question. That's a great thing to teach. And I think we have, you know, we now have a nice medium for teaching that. Thanks. Good question. Yeah, please. Hi, my name is Kevin Evans. Um, you mentioned several times the necessity for establishing and stating goals before um, starting a computational procedure. In education, our, the goal that we're often after is uh, preparing students for job readiness rather than looking at how jobs actually fit in society and in life and uh, investigating what else could fill that need. So I'm curious for you, how do you go about, for one, um, structuring, like figuring out good goals, and then also how do you know when you've reached deep enough so that you can begin on the process? Okay, that's a, I mean, I think, you know, the trick is to be fluent enough with the tools that the questions you ask, you're gonna be able to get somewhere really quickly. And you may then discover that the place you thought you were going to go isn't the place you should be going because there's something else that's actually a better goal to have. I mean, in terms of, of how do you fit this into what students can do, I mean, so for example, in today's world, one of the things that I've been sort of a personal you know, thing is get it to the point where random kids in random places in the world can learn enough about Wolfram language and so on that they can be productive uh, employees or whatever else um, at some young age. And for example, you know, if you take data science as an area, which is sort of kind of just like, you've got data, what does it mean? Pretty much any organization is in the position where they've got data and they want to know what it means, okay? So it will be the case that there will be kids who know Wolfram language and so on, who can go into any organization and say, okay, give me your data, I'll tell you something about what it means. And that's an example of, you know, that's an immediately employable kind of thing. Now, if you ask, you know, how does, you know, if you're, if you're saying how do we map what we're teaching into what employers will want, um, you know, as a, you know, one of my points is this whole sort of direction development of computational X for all X, that's a critical thing 
that employers will really care about. I mean, it's not, you know, I find it kind of ironic that there are people for a long time in my company, we didn't hire people who'd gone through computer science programs because the computer science programs were teaching, this was like 25 years ago, they were teaching very theoretical things that were irrelevant to actual, you know, the actual practical development of software. Then the pendulum really swung completely the other way and a lot of what's taught in a lot of kinds of computer science programs is this extremely practical, you know, how to do agile programming with Java or something. Um, and, uh, you know, this again is actually, you know, it's a very short term thing. It's not, it's a trade basically. It's not really a, it's not, it's not something, it's a, it's a trade of this particular moment in history, so to speak. And, you know, what's much more useful to at least in a, in a you know, my own little example of, of uh, as an employer, so to speak, is people where you can give them some project problem and they can figure out using, you know, in our case, computational thinking um, to, you know, how to attack that and how to make progress on it. Thank you. Um, hi, Stephen. I'm Helen. I'm a master's student here at School of Education. I'm curious, among your various roles as an entrepreneur leading 800 people, as an educator offering camps to both adults and kids, and as a father of four, which role is the most challenging and how computer think, com computational thinking help you navigate the role? Well, that's an interesting question. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't think any of them have been, I haven't viewed any of them as Super challenging. I don't know. You can ask my kids. You could ask my kids what they, they, they um, you know, I always had the theory that, that, um, that I've been doing management of adults for years. And so uh, kids would be straightforward. Actually, kids turn out to be a little different. But, um, uh, the, um, you know, I think that um, uh, one of the things that I always find interesting is can one live one's own paradigm, so to speak? That is, you know, if you invent a paradigm uh, like sort of computational thinking kinds of things, to what extent do you lead your life? Um, with using that paradigm. And so I do find that when it comes to sort of formulating what should I do and how should I think about things and how should I set the company up and so on, I do think about that in terms of, you know, if I were designing a Wolfram language function that did that, how would it work? And that turns out to be that's what this department at the company should do. I mean, that's a, it, it does turn out to be it's a way of structuring one's thinking that I find very, very useful. Now, there are other things like, for example, I'm a, you know, a data enthusiast, so I've collected, uh, I collect all kinds of data on myself, and I've been doing that for 30 years. And I, I somewhat, to my horror, discovered a few years ago that I'm the human who's collected more data about themselves than anybody else. And that's kind of another living the paradigm kind of thing. I don't, I often, you know, don't, I don't look at this data that much, but occasionally I'll go and wonder something about myself, and I can just go back and figure out, you know, maybe it's a simple thing, like I've just switched keyboards on my computer. Did I type faster on my old keyboard or on my new keyboard? I can answer that in five minutes, right? And that's um, uh, because I, you know, I have all the data. I have every keystroke I've typed for the last 20 years or something. Um, and uh, um, and it, it's um, actually the, so, so I think, um, uh, so, the extent, I mean, I find computational thinking is a, is a great way to structure thinking about things. And, I, you know, the thing I found uh, in my own, um, you know, efforts, you know, I've done a bunch of big projects in my life, and they all seem to be somewhat different. Some are about basic science, some are about technology, and so on. I think the thing that I finally realized is that actually I only have one skill, and I think people are, you know, are my, my the one skill that I'm reasonably good at is taking these big complicated areas, kind of breaking them down into sort of simple primitives, and then kind of doing the engineering to build back up again to something, to something useful. So it's kind of the, it's sort of what one might think natural science might be about, although it doesn't tend to be that way in most practical you know, people doing it. It's like take the world and figure out you know, what, are the, what are the underlying components and so on. But in a sense, it's actually what scholarship should be. Thank you. We have five more people. Let's uh, move a bit more briskly. Yes, hi, thank you. My name is Rosalie bellinger -Ryu. I'm a preceptor in the mathematics department here. And I'm wondering if you could address this problem that I see that we have in mathematics and maybe science and life in general of the genius myth 
this idea that you're born to be a genius, you're born to be a CEO, you're born to be good at math. Um, in fact, you were introduced as a, as a certified genius by Mr. Gardner. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how we can break that myth and maybe computational thinking can help. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, one point of view, as I was mentioning before, I mean, my own perhaps optimistic view of the human condition, so to speak, is that people have various skills and, the, the ch and there are many niches in the world and the question is, is there a niche into which your skill fits well? And sometimes that's a, you know, that's a challenging process to find that niche. I'm not sure that education necessarily does a great job of showing people what the portfolio of possible niches is. Um, I think that it tends to be quite narrow in the sense that what you teach, you know, it's like pick even an old fashioned encyclopedia and say, you know, what fraction of the encyclopedia is actually talked about in standard education? And even more so, you know, what you might find on the, on the web or whatever else. Um, I think that that, um, so, you know, I, I think the, this question of whether, uh, you know, I think that there are two, my own view would be that there are two versions of the, this genius myth thing. There's both, there's both a version that says, you know, are you born with, I, I think there's a, you know, people are born with all kinds of different skills. Can they figure out how to take what skills they have and turn them into something that's going to be successful for them? I think though the other theory is that everybody can do everything, I don't think is true. I mean, that is, I don't think you can take, you know, what I've noticed is, I've noticed, for example, people learning computational thinking, okay? Very broad range of people can learn it, but there are people who really pick it up quickly. And there are people who you might think would pick it up quickly, but they don't. You know, there are people who might be very educated in math, but they really, you know, they think about, oh, I don't know, you know, they're, they're great at doing math competitions, for example, but when you say, let's, you know, study things in a, more, in a broader way, which involves more judgment and so on, they just, they just don't get it. Um, so I, you know, I think it, it kind of goes both ways that there's a, that there's, you know, as I see it, it's a matching problem of, you know, what, what, you know, can you figure out what you're really good at doing, what you really, you know, like doing, and can you, you know, can you match that with something that exists as a niche in the world today? And if it doesn't exist, you can always try building it. I mean, this is, this is my kind of theory of, um, you know, it's a lot more effort to build a niche than to, than to fit into an existing niche, but it's, um, and it's always a trade-off for people, you know, when you, if you're like an academic or something like that, you can say, I'll work on this super popular area where there's, you know, where there's tons of people working on it, and then anything I do will be immediately, people will know why it's important, but there'll be a zillion competitors to everything I'm doing, where I can pick this total backwater where nobody's cared about it for 50 years, and then, you know, you know you're the unique person doing that. Um, and, uh, uh, but you then have to tell the world why it's important. I mean, for myself, you know, I'm, I'm much more interested in, I like building what I call alien artifacts, which means things that you might, you know, things that you might not have thought would exist in the world, but one can make them exist, so to speak, and which are typically not things that, you know, were kind of in the flow of what was already happening. Okay, thanks for the question. Next, please. Hi there, I'm a, oh sorry, Hi, I'm a master's student at the Ed School. Um, uh, thank you for your thoughts so far. It seems um, very resource uh, intensive for educating and for like, teaching, and I'm just wondering um, whether you had any thoughts on measures or proposals that would make sure that it was equitable and that it was you know, accessible for everyone and to ensure that there were equal opportunities there for engaging in this competitional thing that could potentially lead to sort of considerable um, discrepancies arising in terms of inequality. Yeah, right. I mean, look, you know, you go to the website, you go into this free thing that, you know, anybody can play with if they have, you know, if they have a smartphone, they can start playing with it. Um, I've actually been really interested in trying to figure out how do you spread this as broadly as possible. So, for example, our summer camp, you know, the first few years we got the kids who came were from the fanciest schools that, you know, that one's always heard of. And I was kind of, kind of frustrated by that. Um, and so, you know, we started off running these ads in the Wolfram Alpha sidebar, and we know a decent fraction of high school kids, for example, in the US use Wolfram Alpha, so that was a broad, you know, range of kids we got. And we were quite successful in the sense that in more recent years, it's been a very good geographic distribution of kids, not just from the, the fancy schools at the big cities. The thing that we haven't succeeded at so far is, and I don't really know why, um, is, you know, we were offering scholarships and things and, and almost nobody took us up on those scholarships. So although these kids were coming from less fancy schools, they were not, 
you know, they were socioeconomically still sort of advanced kids. And I, I think for me, you know, this is a part that I'm very curious about, but I don't have a good solution for, is, okay, this is something that's going to be important in, you know, the best jobs of the 21st century. You know, how do you get some kid who's out somewhere, you know, away from sort of influences that say this is important, so to speak, to still kind of um, have access? You know, I think, I think we have... You know, I think we're being quite successful at having the sort of technological access be possible. I think the question of how we get the kids to be motivated and to connect, that's something I don't, I, I've been very interested in solving and I don't know how to solve. Well, you have an audience here, they may... Yes, Thank right. You. I, Thank we, you. We, yes, next, please. Um, hi, my name is Elisha. I'm a sophomore at the college studying computer science and actually enjoying a theory of computation class that I'm taking right now. And uh, one of the points of view that came up in the class was um, that every natural process action, even thought, could be reduced to a computable function. Um, and you introduced computational thinking as a way to model the world, but no model is perfect. And so I was wondering what, you, what your thoughts on, are about uh, what's lost through computational thinking or that well, so, so, I mean, this idea that the world can be modeled in computational terms, I suppose I've been personally quite, quite involved in, in people coming to believe that, so to speak. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of guilty of being, being an originator of, of that kind of concept. Now, your statement about models are never perfect, you're absolutely right. One of the things about models, models are always controversial in the sense that somebody will say, this model captures, you know, like a, a classic example I was involved in years ago was snowflake growth, okay? So I had a model that explained the basic, you know, elaborate uh, sort of tree-like structure of snowflakes, okay? There was another model that did really well explaining the growth rate of the arms of a snowflake. And so you might say, so if you're interested in the growth rate of the arms of a snowflake, you pick that, that second model, because my model didn't really talk about the growth rate of the arms. But that second model also said that snowflakes should be spherical. Um, which is, which is, you know, it's fine. If you're interested in the growth rate of the arms, it doesn't matter that the thing says it should be spherical. But most of the time, modeling is about deciding what you care about and idealizing everything else away. There is one unique example where that won't be the case. If we find a fundamental theory for physics, there will be a precise theory that is just, this is our universe, and it's exactly our universe. But that's the, that's the one example of sort of the perfect model. Now, if you ask the question, you know, do brains work according to computational, in, in computational ways, the answer is, I absolutely think so. I think that we are getting to see, you know, in, in modern neural network stuff, we're getting to see a lot of kinds of things which are remarkably brain-like in their activity. It's interesting to take apart a neural net and say, what's happening inside? Um, and to realize how alien that intelligence is, so to speak. So, so for example, one thing, uh, you know, and one- You should explain neural nets here is not neurons necessary. It's just no, no, it's a, a program it's a, that it's works a, in a certain way. Right. It, uh, neural nets are a fascinating story in the history of science. Ma I mean, the mathematical- Right. The, the, it's a purely, it's compositions of functions, yeah. basically, that happened to get invented in the 1940s as an idealized model for brains. Um, and for many, many years, they were kind of things that people sort of talked about but didn't think were very interesting. And then suddenly, five years ago, because computer power became uh, greater, and also because somebody was lucky to do the right experiment at the right time, um, it became possible to see how to take, uh, uh, for example, that image identifier that I showed you. That was, that was created by training one of these neural nets on 30 million images. <laughs> it's about the same number of images as a, as a human might see in the first few years of life. And it was trained to associate those images with about 10,000 words that describe things in the world. Now, what's interesting, if you take that thing apart and you say, what's it doing inside? Well, inside, it's making all kinds of distinctions. It's deciding, you know, it's got, it's got to decide, is this picture a picture of an elephant or a teacup? And somewhere in the middle, it's going to say, well, this image, it's going to make a sort of distinction, like a 20 questions type distinction. It's going to say, this image is kind of blobby in this way, and this one is not. So that one is going to go down the elephant track, and that one is going to go down the teacup track. What's interesting about those distinctions that it's making is, those are distinctions that it's learnt that we humans don't necessarily understand. You know, society, our culture could have developed in such a way that we would have a word for that distinction. 
but we don't necessarily. Some of those distinctions we do happen to have words for, but in a sense what's happened is the, the neural net has learnt its own kind of culture and invented its own distinctions and its own words. You know, we humans deal with maybe 50,000 words. You know, in, in what's emerging in these kinds of systems, you could readily have hundreds of thousands, millions of distinctions that are being made, but may turn out to be very valuable distinctions that we just don't happen to make. I mean, it's like in the progress of science, you know, occasionally people will discover some, some way of organizing the way of thinking about the world. It's kind of a very circular thing because people realize, like fractals were a good example. Before fractals were talked about, there were images that people had made that were fractals, but when you read the art history books, the art historians just ignored those images because they had no way to describe them. So now we, now we know, you know there are these nested patterns, they're fractals, we have a way to talk about them. And so now, and, but, but now that, that is really reinforced because we start actually using them in the world that we build for ourselves. So it's kind of a very circular thing. And then we have more words that describe things that are in the world, but these are things that are, you know, there are things in the world that were just put there by nature, and there are things in the world that were put there because we understood that those were interesting things, and so we started building our world to have those things in it. And so it's, a, it's an interesting sort of circular thing that I think also relates to these questions about, you know, what do you end up teaching about, what do you end up caring about? Long Thanks for your question. We don't yeah. turn into elephants or teacups at seven, but I know people have schedules. So why don't each of you ask your question seriatim, and Steve, Stephen will um, answer them as he wishes. First, uh, young, young man. I was, based, um, I was curious, based on your experience with your summer camp in school and just your general experiences with higher education, um, are there some universally effective exercises based um, either in classroom teaching or just things you can do on your own that develop computational thinking? OK, I can answer that okay. one because it's a, it's, it's a um, you just have to do it. You just have to take questions you're interested in and try and you know, make them be computational. I think that's the, you know, I don't know of any kind of, you know, exercise you can do that, uh, you know, I think, I think it's one of these things you, you, you learn it by doing it, so to speak. And the good news is it's very easy to start doing it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that people mentioned about the image identification, that, that, that in that it looks like you've uh, done a superb job of, of doing what used to be called, or still is called, a fuzzy logic, and giving the probability of whether it's a canopy or a human face. And, but I, when, I wanted to apply that then also to when you generated sort of that pyramid, that it looked like you had five uh, black and white boxes which... Uh, and it looked like that the computer tried to generate the law which generated what that sequence, sequence was. Um, and it would seem that the same sort of probabilistic analysis need be done because that series can be generated by even odd for black white and can be generated by any modular arithmetic and base of your number system. So I was wondering why uh, it had just a unique pyramid with a hundred percent probability that that sequence of black yeah, right. boxes. So, so, so I mean, this is just—it's just an example of a really simple program. So here's another really simple program. I just changed the rules. These are just precise deterministic rules. I could run that program, and uh, then I get a different result. Oh. Or I could say. So each, th this number is just a, a code that allows us to specify a different program. So right, but presumably your, the code, it's finding a code that explains those black and white boxes based on... Uh, no, no, this no? is a very, very simple thing. What's going on here is absolutely what you see is what you have. It's very, very, very simple. So if I, if I were to just do this, let's say for 20 steps, and um, show kind of a, a, a mesh there, what would happen is every place in this picture, like, like let's pick that place there, okay? What, what's above it is two whites and a black. So we go back in this rule up here and we say two whites and a black makes a black. So it's, a, it's, a, it's just saying, here's the rule, this is what it does. 
So it's a, it's a very minimal example. So in fact, if you were doing sort of pre-computer science, if you wanted to do this with, with kindergartners, for example, you can do pre-computer science. It's kind of a fun exercise. You can say, OK, you've just got a, 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 you know, a piece of graph paper, and you've got these rules. Start filling in the, the graph paper according to these rules. And what's kind of neat is they say, well, I don't know. There's nothing interesting is going to happen. It's just way too simple rules. You keep going for a while, and suddenly there'll be some pattern that emerges. And by the way, that's a kind of what you're seeing there is a very fundamental feature of kind of the process of computation. It's, a, it's an example that doesn't involve arithmetic. It doesn't involve numbers. You don't you really, this can be done by, you know, well, I've seen this by like five-year-olds. I don't know what the what the um, uh, and it's a it's a great little little example of how and actually if you really want to have have fun with this, the um, it turns out well my favorite example is mollusk shells turn out to have the patterns that you make this way you find mollusks actually put on their shells um, and that's kind of a neat thing that you can actually have something where you can sort of yourself do the computation so to speak and then you can realize that gosh these mollusks do that same kind of thing too yes I I'm, I'm, I'm going to thank you for your question because we're thank past time I did want to ask one question for, yes. of my own curiosity clearly you find your own mind interesting and a lot of questions that you raise are ones that you raise yourself but I'm interested what do you read whom do you talk to where do you travel what are the things that you do that you find uh, stimulate your, your, your thinking and maybe make you think about things you haven't thought about before well you know I, I lead a weird life in a sense because I'm, I'm you know one so the main thing I spend my time doing I suppose is you know, I, I run a company, and what that, and I'm kind of a, a micromanager of the kinds of things that we make, and that means that what I end up doing, I'm a, strangely, I'm a remote CEO, so I, I'm usually it's just computer screen and and uh, and phones. But what I spend my whole time doing is sort of the thinking in public process of, you know, we're figuring something out. We have an hour to figure this out. You know, this is the problem we're trying to figure out. We're trying to design some feature of our language. There might be 10 people involved in this meeting. Everybody has some something that they're bringing to it. And I'm just trying to, to figure out what, what will happen. And the most extreme and outrageous case of that is something where, you know, we'll be, have something we're trying to figure out. And somebody will say, look, I've read the literature on this. People have been trying to do this for 25 years. And we'll say, well, we have, you know, an hour and a half here. <laughs> so, well, and the remarkable thing is, is that just the very concept that you might be able to do it is already a very important, you know, gives you a, a huge step up. In, um, because people often, you know, in, when fields develop and get sort of deeply, you know, deeply built out, people forget about the fact that the foundations may still be, you know, you may still be able to attack the foundation, so to speak. But anyway, in terms of what, you know, so I suppose the most stimulating thing for me is that I've built up a group of like 800 people or so who I work with a lot and who are continually, you know, uh, I mean, I'm, you know, actively thinking through things all the time, every day. And that's, that's kind of the primary thing. I'm, I'm pretty bad at reading, I must admit. I'm, I'm a, a lousy reader of books. I but might you, have but you're doing more. history, and you must be reading it then. You, yes, you're not making yes, it up. Yes, right? that's true. So, so I, I find I have sort of a hobby of studying um, uh, historical, um, I mean, a typical, um, I write, um, I, I typically write these blog posts, and um, I just wrote one actually about, which I've been meaning to write for years. I usually have to have these excuses. It has to be an anniversary, somebody has to have died, something like that. Um, this is one about um, a, a chap, um, uh, a very interesting um, uh, kind of Victorian uh, scientist. Yeah, I mean, what happens is, you know, I don't know how people did history in the past because, you know, for me, it's like, okay, I wanted to find out the book that this guy's father had written. Okay, I can immediately find it from the Internet Archive and I can go and I can make all kinds of connections and I might be doing, I don't remember whether I did someplace here. Yeah, this guy ran a museum that had, I actually went to, I, I went eventually to Scotland to go see that museum. He was, um, you know, there might be some computational stuff. Let's see whether I have some computational stuff here. This is mostly, um, this is mostly just uh, scanned images of things. But let's see, somewhere here, I think I had something. Oh yeah, that's a bit computational. That was a that was a crocodile skull he collected that uh, we got a 3D scan of. But someplace here, okay. So that's an example, for example, of the literature. Um, you know, citations to this person's work as a function of time over the last hundred years, and so on. Um, but but you know, in, in terms of, for this, I find 
you know, I find these history exercises, um, you know, what I always find interesting is that for any one of these ideas that people have, what you know in hindsight is, oh, this person figured out this thing. But it turns out there's always a story. And I find it really interesting to try and sort of piece together how did the person actually come up with that idea. And there's usually a really long backstory. And it's often quite a puzzle to see, you know, where did they really get these influences that led to that idea. And in the end, there really is a very sort of definite narrative. And I can see for myself, I've, I've gone back and wondered about that for myself because there are things where I figured something out. OK, how did I come to figure that out? So for example, good example is Wolfram Alpha, actually. How did I come to figure out that it might be possible to build Wolfram Alpha? So I wondered, how did I, you know, because I just, as a matter <laughs> of, um, and the answer was, you know, I've been thinking about kind of AI stuff since I was a kid. And I've been thinking, you know, can we build a general computer knowledge engine and my conclusion was no we'd have to figure out how to build a brain like thing to be able to do that well then I did a bunch of basic science and one of the conclusions of that basic science is there isn't really a bright line between brain like intelligent things and sort of mere computation and so that you know what was basically a piece of philosophy ended up being okay we could actually build something like this in terms of you know I, I as a, um, I, I've been fortunate in that I've, I, I know a lot of people in a lot of different fields who are um, kind of have invented lots of kinds of things, and I, I enjoy, um, you know, chatting with them. I find that, you know, in the in the technological world, it's interesting because sort of new companies are coming up, new ideas are being created. Uh, that kind of provides an environment where you can kind of identify um, some of the the new stuff that's happening. I also um, okay, for many years I didn't travel at all, and then one of my um, uh, one of my kids, uh, my older daughter actually, uh, about what was it six years ago or something now, said, "You get all these invitations all over the world, and you turn down 100% of them." She said, "Let me just look at these invitations and pick the ones that we're going to go to." And so, good for you. Uh, I th I th we actually have to go pretty soon. We, he and I have another appointment. So, thank you so much. This is a memorable evening, and I hope you'll all join me in thanking Stephen. <laughs> <laughs>